uh, today's lecture, we're going to go dive deep into some of the main research tasks in multimodal learning. And as Alpi mentioned that last week, uh, sorry, on Tuesday, there's four main prior eras of multimodal research. So multimodal research really started in the 1970s, where people from psychology and philosophy really asked, how can we build these behavioral models to understand human communication and human interaction in these social settings? And in that era, one of the biggest projects was the McGurk effect from a cognitive psychologist, which really looked at the importance of both audio and visual information in speech recognition. So a lot of research then was inspired by psychology and philosophy. And it was not until the 1980s where there was a resurgence and really, really accessible computing tools that people went into the computational era, where the goal was to build some of these computational models to test the psychology and philosophy theories that had developed in the behavioral era. So some of the main research projects in the computational era involved building these statistical models that learn from data for tasks like audiovisual speech recognition. And slowly towards then in the 2000s became the interaction era where people focused less on understanding a single human, but also looked at the interaction between humans and other humans and humans and computers. That was when multimodal HCI saw a boom in research. And finally in the 2010s, uh, ever since you know, there's been deep learning boom, a lot of people have tried applying these deep learning methods to get really, really good performance in multimodal research. And that will be the main focus of our course. So we look at one of some of the specific research tasks that really led to this resurgence in multimodal learning. It started with audiovisual speech recognition in the 1990s. Slowly then, there was also a boom in uh, content-based video retrieval because the internet was starting. There were a lot more videos being available on YouTube and people really wanted to be able to retrieve these videos based on some content such as keywords and descriptions that it provided. So that was a huge motivating factor for both academia and industry to work on multimodal learning. Uh, towards the 2000s, there was huge interest in effective computing, especially from groups like Rosalind Picard's. And so then people also worked on video event recognition. There were these really large traffic challenges where the goal is that you're given a video and you have to recognize the events in the video. Uh, LP's group also did a lot of the work in early work in multimodal sentiment analysis, extending a lot of the work in language-based sentiment analysis to the multimodal form, where you have to look at both verbal and nonverbal cues. Again, aligned with this interaction era, we are trying to build better models for human-computer interaction. And it wasn't really until the uh, middle of the 2010s or 2015s where there was this huge boom in multimodal research, really inspired by the work done in deep learning for these unimodal data sets. For example, really good models for language, such as language models, and really good models for vision, such as your CNNs. And, and the combination of these models really led to a boom in language and vision research. It's not a surprise that two, most, two modalities that people work on primarily in multimodal learning are language and vision. And these are also the modalities that deep learning has had the most success in, probably followed by speech. So in this era, the deep learning era, some of the main tasks that we're looking at involve uh, image captioning, for sure. And given the success of image captioning, being able to generate these really descriptive captions from images, people also started looking at video captioning. So adding this challenge of having the temporal component where we have to reason over long-term interactions in the video and possibly, and possibly give different captions for different times in the video. That was also a big area people looked at. But soon people realized that both image captioning and video captioning, while really catchy subjects that get, gave really good results, there are some inherent problems. And that main problem is that it's really hard to evaluate these generation tasks. So people began kind of simplifying, but also localizing the problem a lot more by looking at visual question answering where again, you're given an image, but instead of captioning any part about the image, you're asking a question about a specific area in the image and you want to uncover an answer based on that. So this converted some of the traditional generation tasks into ones that were more classification based and also more localized because given an image, you can ask questions about any part of the image and get a reasonable answer. There were large data sets built for that and soon there was also a vested interest in extending these to videos, being able to reason across the temporal dependencies given a question 
localizing which part of the video that question refers to and being able to retrieve an answer from that, from that area of the video. Uh, soon after, another area of research that kind of extends these, these multimodal tasks was, was that in multimodal dialogue. We are really trying to build the next generation of these interactive agents that are able to interact both through language, but at the same time also refer to particular aspects in the environment. So building dialogue that is grounded in the environment. Oh, someone's asking a question here. Uh, what is grounding? So grounding is the essential tasks of taking what is described in language and being able to understand what language refers to in the environment. There is no clear definition for this, but throughout the years, that is the definition which people motivate their, their applications based on. So one example is that if I were to ask a question about the image, for example, um, how many boxes are in this image? One example of grounding would be to localize what it means for the word box to be referring to in this image. So you could kind of draw a region around the image representations of box in the image, given your question. So grounding is a very, very important question. It is very similar to alignment in the sense that your goal is to align the meaning of concepts in language with the meaning of concepts in image so that you can reason over them jointly. Uh, we're gonna go into grounding a lot more into in, in some of the future slides that we're gonna look at, in particular when we're gonna go into these uh, specific data sets and applications. So extending multimodal dialogue in um, the early 2018s, there was also a really large benefit of having large scale data sets from industry, especially uh, Google and this YouTube data set, where the goal is to kind of take these videos and understand what are the events going on within them, both as a classification task and also as a retrieval task. So that if you are given some video that you're trying to search for, you can retrieve the correct video. The main goal of YouTube basically. And recently, uh, in the past two years, there's been amazing work that has linked all the great research happening in reinforcement learning and robotics with multimodal learning. So on the reinforcement learning side, people have started to look at uh, language and vision navigation. So you're in some environment and you're given some natural language instruction and you would like to build an agent that is able to navigate and follow these instructions in your environment, combining both aspects of our language and vision understanding and also reinforcement learning to obtain these long-term goals. In terms of robotics, there's also been a resurgence in uh, deep learning for self-driving cars. And a lot of these multi-sensory inputs that these self-driving cars have to take in, spanning both visual and signals such as LiDAR are also being processed by these multimodal machine learning methods. And of course, there's many more problems to come. Uh, recently, multimodal learning has been applied to robotics, to healthcare, to education, and we really hope that you, you're gonna be able to explore some of these existing tasks on this slide and also the tasks that are coming in the future. So given all these real world tasks, we've tried to group our best, we tried our best to group these applications into uh, seven groups. These are by no means exhaustive and this is by no means a perfect categorization, but uh, we'd like to share some of this kind of categorization with you. So that it helps you localize what area you want to work on for your research, research project, and also the data sets that are within this area. So the first one is that on effective recognition, effective computing, uh, building these computers that are able to understand these human-centric behaviors like emotion and sentiment, media description for image and video captioning, multimodal QA, which further localizes media description by only answering a question, by only providing an answer about a specific question targeted to one specific area of the image. Uh, multimodal navigation, which really combines these aspects of reinforcement learning and robotics with understanding language and vision. Uh, multimodal dialogue, being able to hold dialogue with a human while being grounded in an image. Event recognition, these are more computer vision tasks where you like to recognize the activity, in a video and also segment the correct activity, the region corresponding to that activity in a video. And finally, multimedia retrieval, where you're given some tags, possibly some similar images, possibly some tags and language, and you're going to retrieve a similar image or video. Uh, someone asking a really good question here, has the reverse been done? Can we go from caption to videos? Uh, there has been 
well, even caption to images is a really hard problem. If you're trying to retrieve images, it really simplifies the problem. But if you're trying to go from caption to actually generating an image, that is a very, very difficult problem, uh, both in terms of these high dimensional images that you have to generate and also on evaluation. It's really hard to evaluate what makes a good image. And in all of these machine learning tasks, as you have seen, if there lacks good evaluation metrics, it's just really hard to make progress on them. Uh, for caption to video, I would assume that there are some data sets where your goal is to take a caption and retrieve the nearest video. So retrieval kind of simplifies this generation problem into a classification problem over all the videos that you have, which is more likely to be, to be able to be done. Uh, if you wanna go from a caption to actually generating a video, that is most likely a very, very difficult task just because generating videos is really hard to both do and evaluate. Cool. So right now I'm gonna delve into a couple of these categories, I think uh, four of these categories real quick, just to give you a sense of what are some of the main research questions, some of the main data sets, and some of the main, um, main course projects that have been done in this similar area so that you can have a look at what are the standards that other people have done in this course. So we're gonna start with effective computing. Uh, effective computing, the grand goal of being to, of building computers that are able to recognize emotions and human affective states. So when people think effective computing, most of you would just zoom into the first area where the goal is to look at these effective states such as emotions, moods, and feelings. But throughout the years, effective computing has taken a lot of different forms. They've studied a lot of different areas, and many of these are very interesting areas from both psychology and computer science research. So one example is, uh, understanding cognitive states. Given humans, both individuals and in groups, can we understand whether humans are thinking and concentrating? That is very important in education. A lot of multimodal machine learning is being applied to education. The goal is to kind of interact with humans, or interact with teachers in the classroom to find out whether the students are thinking, are concentrating, are curious, or have questions about the material. That is one example of understanding these cognitive states. Uh, in terms of personalities, the goal is not just to model like a single snapshot of emotion, but rather to make a long-term reasoning and long-term judgment of the innate personalities that a human might have, expanding things like you know, introvert and extrovert and other more complex personalities. Pathology focuses primarily on the intersection of machine learning and healthcare. And the goal there is to, to look at humans and decide whether they are prone to various mental health disorders, uh, or such as depression or anxiety and so on. Uh, finally, social processes really extend a lot of the research in both in individual effective computing to that of groups, looking at how humans interact with each other to be able to reason about these social processes. So just to go into a bit more detail and look at some of the labels and annotations that people look at for these tasks. For effective states, uh, most of you are quite familiar with this. The goal here is to recognize some form of emotions, spanning the simpler basic emotions like anger, disgust, fear, and also more complex emotions like shame, guilt, frustration, and anxiety. At the same time, I'm gonna also give you a highlight of these other states. Uh, for cognitive states, it's really about understanding whether someone is engaged, has knowledge, very important for educational purposes. For personalities, uh, not just looking at a single state instantaneous in time, but reasoning over a long term to find out the innate personalities intrinsic to a person. So there's a well-known introvert and extrovert, but it also goes beyond to describe things like whether a person seems to be artistic, seems to be responsible, and seems to be trusting. Pathology is a subset of effective computing that is done a lot in, in uh, LP's group, which is the intersection of machine learning and healthcare. So some of the uh, doctors that we're working with we're actually able to bring these multimodal technologies to these doctors and watch them interact with these patients, given these, per and given these patients both verbal and nonverbal cues. The goal is to uh, kind of predict whether this person is at risk of being depressed, at risk of having anxiety, having trauma, and many of these other mental health, mental health uh, disorders. And this is a very important research problem because most people, when they go to the doctor, they don't know that they themselves are depressed and they're not going to say it clearly from their verbal information that you know, they seem to be depressed. It's really a lot of these subtle nonverbal gestures that you have to look at in order to figure out whether this person is at risk of depression. 
And finally, in the 2000s, in the era of interaction, people also started looking at the social processes, both in terms of human computer interaction and also human human interaction. So being able to understand these social signals in groups and determining whether a group of people show rapport, cohesion, cooperation, or competition. So obviously these are, these are very, very cool problems in machine learning inspired by psychology. But the main drawback about all of these is that the data sets are rather small. And these annotations are also quite difficult to obtain. It really requires a good amount of human expertise to be able to, to annotate accurately a lot of these labels for things like you know, social processes and pathology. You need doctors to annotate that accurately. Uh, but there are still some data sets in this area that I'll go into. And there are also people looking at machine learning methods to model these effective computing topics. If you're interested more, uh, this course will not go that much into effective computing. The focus is more on the algorithms and multimodal machine learning, but LP teaches this other course on multimodal effective computing in this other semester. So usually he teaches it in spring and that might be taught next semester or the following year to be determined. But you can always get these slides from uh, Piazza in previous versions of the course if you're interested in more on effective computing. So I'm getting some questions here. Can we get some references to state-of-the-art papers in each of these subdomains? Of course, um, that is the goal of some of the things that I'll be going into, both in terms of data sets and models. Some of these references will also be posted online. And, and also, you know, getting these state-of-the-art papers is also a goal of your research. So once you localize into what area that you're trying to look at, you should, the first thing you should do is kind of look at these state-of-the-art papers, both not just in machine learning, but also, you know, in prior work in psychology. So a lot of this effective computing did start from being inspired from psychology and philosophy research. So you should also look at some of the state-of-the-art works, some of the state-of-the-art features that people use in psychology as well. That will constitute a big part of the first project assignment. Another question I have here is, is most of multimodal learning supervised? That's a great question. Um, after this lecture, you will think that most of multimodal learning is supervised because I'm introducing these data sets, data, data set by data set, and a lot of the models that I introduce will also be specific to these data sets. But one of the main areas of, of multimodal learning and machine learning in general is that of going towards unsupervised learning. And there's also a ton of cool challenges there. How can you learn useful multimodal representations without labels? Uh, some of it we'll get into in the fourth or fifth week of course of the course. Uh, if you're interested early, I think there are also some papers that will be posted coming soon and you can also email some of the instructors to talk more about unsupervised multimodal learning. Yeah, but these are great questions. If at any time anyone has any questions, just feel free to type it in the chat. I'm looking out for it and I'll answer these questions as soon as I can. Cool, so that was a brief overview of, of effective computing. Um, so right now we're going to go into some of the specific data sets that people look at in effective computing so that you have a sense of uh, what machine learning models have been designed for it. And it's impossible, it's impossible for me to talk about effective computing without talking about this audio visual emotion challenge. This challenge has been here since 2011. It's been here for around 10 years. And every year they have this new challenge on being able to test whether machine learning models can take both audio content what people say in the verbal modalities and also visual content. So people's gestures and expressions in the nonverbal modalities. And really trying to understand whether you can infer emotions from these modalities. Uh, some of the annotations include both discrete emotions, spanning happiness, sadness, and surprise, and also continuous emotions, which might be a term new to some of you. Continuous emotions are uh, real valued dimensions of emotion that range across continuous numbers, that range across the spectrum. So one spectrum which people analyze is a spectrum from positive to negative, that is called valence. Another spectrum which people analyze is that of active to passive, that is called arousal. So a lot of these data sets, they are looking at both valence, positive to negative, and arousal, active to passive, and really getting human annotators to, to annotate these on a continuous spectrum. So it's a regression problem. 
And the goal is to take in this audiovisual content and be able to predict both your discrete and continuous emotions. Some of the uh, recent data sets also have transcripts, so you can process text without actually looking at the audio features. And there's also been some extensions of this, um, some of them in other languages like German, some of them more focused on human computer interaction. And some of these are more popular than others. Uh, one really interesting data set is this one called the Ricola data set. And it's really popular, firstly, for a couple of reasons. First, it contains very fine-grained annotations at the frame level. So some of the data sets I'm going to be describing to you have an entire video. And after you finish the entire video of someone speaking, you have a single annotation for that entire video. For the Zucola data set, you have this entire video and you actually have labels at every frame. So you have these temporal labels. In this case, uh, these are continuous emotions of arousal and valence. And essentially you have a slider of these continuous emotions that goes up and down across the frames in the video. So these are really, really fine grained labels that add in uh, further challenges, which have made this data set a very interesting one for people to study. Another interesting aspect is that apart from both audio and visual features, it also includes physiologic, physiological data. So one of them is uh, electrocardiography, which is a graph of voltage versus time of the electrical activity of the heart. So how fast the heart is pumping. And that is measured using some, using some electrodes on the skin. Uh, EDA is another another physiological signal that measures how much a person is sweating. So both you know, sweating and heart rates have been seen in psycholo psychology research to be predictors of emotion. And the goal here is also to see where the machine learning models are able to accurately integrate both your verbal, nonverbal features, and also these you know, physiological data sources to be able to get better predictions. So a lot of these data sets in effective computing have been around for longer, just because effective computing is an earlier field that started in both psychology and statistical analysis before moving into this deep learning era. And it's always a trade-off. So a lot of these data sets in effective computing have been along for some time. The benefit is that there's a lot of work in both uh, data-driven and also psychology research in studying these, these problems. But the main, the main drawback is that you then have to work harder to find uh, ways to improve these problems, these uh, data sets. Cool, some of the, I'll also talk about some of the research that has come out of our group. So our group has really focused on multimodal sentiment analysis. So sentiment is a concept in language and people have studied this in linguistics, essentially whether a person is reflecting positively or negatively to a particular video. This started off as a main research project in NLP. Language is clearly very important. If I express something like, you know, I went to the restaurant and I loved the food, the service was awesome. It's clear that I'm giving a very subjectively positive opinion about this, about a topic at hand, which is this restaurant. So language kind of offers most of the heavy lifting, offers most of the information and in sentiment analysis. But uh, we also realized that people also tend to express their opinions in nonverbal gestures. So things like, you know, sarcasm, things like uh, just being amb ambivalent in language, but, you know, showing visibly discontent, vis visible discontent in using uh, your verbal, nonverbal gestures. So we've, what we've done is we extended some of this work in language-based sentiment analysis to these multimodal sources. We've collected some videos on YouTube spanning many speakers and spanning a bunch of opinion videos. And the goal is to take in these uh, language, visual, and acoustic data and make a prediction about human sentiment. We've also since then expanded this data set. And so now this is one of the largest data sets in multimodal learning that spans almost 25,000 video segments, uh, 1,000 speakers, and 250 topics. And we've also extended the annotations from both fine-grained sentiment, five-class sentiment, to a lot of these emotions, these discrete emotions as well. Uh, at the same time, people have also uh, extended the research on both from single person to multi-party emotion recognition. So this MELT data set is a data set that's collected from the Friends TV show, and you're annotating the emotions of each of the characters separately. So the goal here is not just to look at the overall sentiment and emotions of the entire conversation, but rather to keep these baseline models of um, how each 
each individual is is progressing in terms of their emotions. Now, in this case, uh, one of the characters is always showing positive emotion, joy and surprise, while the other person is uh, showing more anger. Cool. So I have a question here. I would think that defining emotional state will require combinations of some time period of facial landmarks, gestures, and eyes across multiple frames. So does it make sense to have emotion labels at a frame level? That's a great question. So um, this really ties into what I'm gonna talk a bit next, which is what are the core challenges most involved in affect recognition? So I think the main question here is that, is that of the alignment problem? Because you have these like really long-term videos, you have language, you have visual and acoustic, and a lot of these features are not necessarily going to be aligned. If I'm saying something positive at time five, I'm most likely going to smile at some other time. Maybe I will smile you know, two seconds later. And maybe I will even laugh maybe a few seconds later. So there's this alignment problem where not all the modalities are perfectly aligned at the same time level. So whether it makes sense to have annotations at that particular frame level. So I think a way that people deal with this well, there's two aspects. First of all, you have to deal with the alignment problem, which is a big problem in research, regardless of whether you want to have predictions at a frame level or you want to have predictions at a video level. Alignment is one of those problems which is always there. Uh, in terms of actually having emotions at a frame level, what people do tend to do is that uh, you will want to annotate, when these annotators are looking at these videos, they're kind of having, they have a sliding bar. So the frame the annotation for the frame t equals to five is actually looking at the uh, information before t equals to five. So you want to keep a rolling average of the features that you have seen so far and use that to update your, your, your frame level emotion annotation. So in this case, it's kind of simplifying the alignment problem to only having to reason about information that has happened in the, the previous time steps in the video. But these are awesome questions. Um, these are kind of the research questions that you should be looking at. Basically, not just looking at the data set itself, but really challenging some of the hypotheses and assumptions and research questions that came out when, this, when the authors of these data sets built them. So going on that similar vein, um, when everyone's working on these tasks, I want everyone to think about what are the main challenges in modeling these problems, not just trying to get better results on the data set by really thinking about some of the research questions. So uh, for affect recognition, a lot of the main challenges comes in fusing these modalities. You have multiple data sources, some of which are more useful than others at different time periods. The goal is really to how to best leverage all of these data sources to make a prediction. At the same time, you need to have suitable levels of, of extraction to get really good multimodal representations. And you also need alignment. So in this case, because most of these data sets are temporal data sets consisting of videos, alignment is a very big challenge where you have to align um, you know, positive words in text with smiles and gestures and the visual modalities. Co-learning is something that people don't usually study, but it's also an area which has, has arisen in affective computing. And there was one example which LP talked about last week, which is to look at language-based sentiment analysis, but during training, you're kind of enriching language with visual and audio behaviors. If you recall, that was the model where you took language and you're trying to construct, um, construct these audio and visual behaviors to make language more informative. But at test time, you're only using language. So that is one example of co-learning. And I have seen people apply co-learning to problems and affect recognition. Cool. At this point, uh, I'm going to go into two examples of past research projects in, from taken, done by students taking this course on uh, affective computing. So one of these research projects is called Select Additive Learning. And the goal here is to uh, perform better on multimodal sentiment analysis across these data sets. And the main idea is to reduce the effect of confounding factors. So what are these confounding factors? Let me give you an example. So suppose you have a data set like this. You have um, each of these are video clips and they're saying something and you know, each of these, each of these uh, 
the speakers are saying multiple utterances. You know, some of them are positive, some of them are negative, annotated in the MOSI dataset. So the main problem in machine learning research is to find what rules you can infer from this data. Rules being a mapping from uh, input features to labels that you want to predict. So if you look at this, for example, you see the first person is smiling, the third person is smiling, and they consistently show positive sentiment. So one rule that you could infer uh, from training these supervised learning models is that the presence of a smile leads to positive sentiment. Another rule that you could infer based on you know, this person and this person down here is that the presence of a frown indicates negative sentiment. And these are very reasonable rules that most likely would generalize. Likewise, you could see that a nod might refer to positive sentiment. But if you look at this data set, another rule that you could infer is that because this person is wearing glasses and this person is wearing glasses, and so is this person, and they all co-occur with the fact that they're saying something that contains negative sentiment, a possible rule that you could infer that would still be consistent with this data set is that the presence of glasses worn by a person leads to negative sentiment. And if you, if you use such a rule and you train that on this data set, you will still get really good training and test error. But this is what we call a confounding factor that most likely will not generalize. So essentially, this is an artifact in the data collection process. So what the students proposed was to build a solution that learns representations that kind of masks out the effect of user identity. Because a lot of, they found, they went through these data sets, they found that a lot of these confounding factors actually had to do with these, you know, person-specific things, like, you know, whether a person is wearing glasses, whether a person, you know, is male or female, has, you know, black or brown hair. So what they did was to modify the conventional representation learning approach that goes from features through a model to your labels to a new model that takes in features, learns the representations, but at the same time also takes in identities, learns the representation, and adding noise to the representation of these identities. The hypothesis here is that the representation of the, uh, the representation that is most useful in predicting a label should come from these person independent features, you know, things that whether you're actually smiling or nodding, and these person-dependent factors, which actually should not take part in making your prediction. Things like uh, whether you're actually wearing glasses or what color your hair is. So by adding noise and sampling various amounts of noise across this data set, you're actually marginalizing the effect of speakers out from the model. You're making sure that a model is, is not really taking into account the identity of the speaker and still being able to focus on the real useful input features towards making this prediction. Right, so this was a course project done, I think, about three years ago, and this was published in this uh, multimedia conference. Another research project, um, which is also focused on multimodal sentiment analysis, is that of solving the alignment and both, fu both fusion and alignment problem. So the goal is to estimate the importance of each modality at the word level in a video. So uh, in terms of fusion, the goal is to kind of take this video and break it apart into multiple frames. And for each frame, we're going to reason about whether the language, visual, and acoustic gestures are actually useful. So in this case, we see that this speaker is only showing a smile at this time step. And what we should do is build a gate that lets these visual features pass into the model to predict that this person is showing positive sentiment. And there are other times of the video where the person is not showing any visible gestures from visual modality, we should not use this visual modality towards making a prediction. So the goal is to you know, build a model that is more interpretable, that estimates modality and temporal importance, and learns to attend to this important information, both across modalities and across time. And our solution here was, um, there were a couple of components in this model. One of the main components is to, to be the first one to do a word level alignment. So we're actually segmenting, uh, we're defining like a reasonable approximation to segment the video into the level of words. So we're gonna take all of these words, each of them correspond to one time step, and we're gonna take the audio and visual gestures and align them with respect to these words. So the basic assumption here is that uh, whatever is, you're gonna say a word, and we're also going to attend to the visual and audio gestures that were set during this same duration. And in terms of estimating the importance, we have both a temporal attention, 
which estimates the importance of each time step. Certain time steps might correspond more towards predicting a label if you know, that time step has a very visibly important word or gesture, and other time steps will correspond less. And for these other modalities like audio and visual, we also have this gated attention that is a binary gate that is either zero or one, which either lets these uh, audio visual features go through if the model estimates that they are important towards predicting a label and zero otherwise. So the hypothesis here is that the attention weights represent the contribution of each modality at each time step. And likewise, the modality gates is meant to determine the importance and contribution of each modality. And because these gates are zero and one, they're not continuous numbers that you can back propagate through. We're actually training these gates using reinforcement learning. And that's one of the main technical contributions in this paper. Cool. So those are two examples of cross projects that were done in previous years on effective computing. Now I'm gonna jump into a media description. So as you recall in this computational and deep learning era, media description, uh, given an image like a video, like videos and audios and being able to accurately caption the image was one of the main enablers of modern multimodal machine learning research both in terms of uh, really large data sets that have images and captions. And a lot of these data sets are also obtained from the internet. For example, a lot of these data sets are from things like Instagram, Flickr, where you have uh, where people just upload these images and provide some user generated captions for these. So these large data sets and progress in, in modeling really enable this modern boom in multimodal machine learning research. And one of the biggest data sets that enabled this was the MS Coco dataset. Uh, this one was a really large 120,000 images. And each of these images was taken onto Amazon Mechanical Turk and annotated with um, five different captions. And it's really important to get high quality annotations that span many captions because, uh, because this is like a, this, this problem requires you to reason about many different captions that could be generated from the same image. Uh, the main challenge here, again, is that of evaluation. Uh, many of these generation tasks, it's very difficult to evaluate what is what makes a good caption and what makes a bad caption. You don't want to necessarily just uh, constrain yourself with something like supervised learning where you just try to match the captions exactly because there's just so many ways a human could caption an image and many of these could still be reasonable captions despite not being in the data set. So when these people released uh, these data set, they also had an evaluation server. Um, and the goal here was to at least try their best to take this candidate sentence and evaluate against a set of ground truth sentences using either human or evaluation metrics. And what they did at CVPR 2015 was that they actually uh, tested a lot of these models that people submitted and they did a very exhaustive test using human annotations. They actually gave these images and captions to humans on mTurk, and they had humans look at whether these captions actually made sense. And you no, know, unsurprisingly, the answer was no. A lot of these, um, these models done by Google, Microsoft, a lot of these big companies, they had very good models, but a lot of it was still quite far from how humans would judge whether a good, a good caption would be. So there's still a lot of work to be done in this area. One of the main challenges, again, is annotation, because ideally you don't want to build a model and have to annotate it using humans, evaluate it using humans every time you retrain your model and retest a new model. Human labels are really expensive. So people have also tried coming up with automatic labels. These are things like Cider, Meteor, Rogue, Blue. Essentially, these look at um, the captions that you generate and some of the reference captions, and they match some overlap in terms of your n grams, so how much your your one, one gram, two grams match with the reference captions. And the main question here is that, you know, if you want to not rely that much on human evaluation and instead rely on these automatic evaluation methods, which are really, really fast, well, these two things have to be consistent. So there must be a clear correspondence, clear correlation between automatic and human evaluations. Well, the answer is that it doesn't, it, it doesn't correspond so well. In fact, just based on automatic captions, 
a lot of these models from the same challenge by Google, MSR, they actually outperform human performance. So clearly there's some issue with these uh, automatic metrics that are kind of allowing these models to overfit to the training data, uh, still get really good automatic evaluation performance, but obviously not good performance as judged by a human. So at the same time, a lot of people are working on building better models for these media description and captioning problems. A lot of the research is also going into building better evaluation metrics that you know, contain a big a mix of human and automatic metrics that are more reliable. So soon after image captioning, uh, people extended the task to videos uh, to maybe tackle this new problem of having having temporal dependence. Um, so essentially you want to capture not just a single part of an image, but also caption various parts of a video, possibly you know, across a continuous spectrum as the video is being played. And there's also been some interesting data sets coming out, including a Charest data set, which including a Charest data set, uh, in this case, you're actually asking mTurkers to act out this description. So the benefit here is that you actually have these ground truth scripts that you start by generating. You get the videos of people acting it out, and then you get more people to annotate these descriptions. So this really allows for more fine-grained control over what you're actually seeing in a data set and what the ground truth captions should be. There's some questions here. Uh, one question is, what is the objective function in image captioning? That's a good question. Um, again, coupled with the fact that it's very difficult to evaluate, there is no clear objective function that people prefer. I think the one that's most popular is just to have something that uh, optimizes for the negative log likelihood at every time step when you're generating the sentence. So similar loss function to that in uh, language modeling or machine translation. But as people work on designing better evaluation metrics, people have also started looking at building objective functions that directly optimize for these evaluation metrics directly. Because you know, there's, there is a mismatch between optimizing for negative log likelihood and some of the, the metrics that people care about. Um, so there's some research done in designing these better objective functions. Some of the main challenges there are that some of the objective, some of the evaluation metrics that should be optimized for, including these things like uh, blue cider rogue scores, which check for matching n-grams, these are not differentiable. So it's not as trivial to optimize as your cross entropy loss. So people have also designed some methods to circumvent that, being able to tackle these, uh, these directly optimizing for these evaluation metrics, but at the same time handling the fact that they are not differentiable. Someone is also asking, can we have an evaluation model? Uh, since verification is easier than generation, this could be feasible. So essentially a verification, a evaluation model that takes in images and possible captions and scores how good these captions are. Uh, I have not seen some of this, but I wouldn't be surprised if some of these exist. I think it definitely is an interesting idea. It's um, similar in the sense to how people who work in complexity theory know that you know solving an NP hard problem is clearly harder than verifying that a solution to an NP hard problem is indeed true. So that is that is one of the interesting research areas. If you're interested in that, I would highly suggest you look at some of the related work and and perhaps do it for your course project. Cool. So another way to circumvent the problem of these really difficult evaluation metrics is to change the task from direct generation of the captions to referring expressions, which essentially what you're doing is given an image and you're given some descriptions within the image and your goal is to localize the particular areas in the image that you are referring to. For example, in this case, you, um, the, the, you have given an image, there's two women, the goal is to localize the women on the right in the white shirt, and your goal is to, uh, to be able to identify this particular object that the text is corresponding to. Uh, this is also a pretty interesting task. It is related to grounding, the goal where you're trying to link these linguistic elements, so what is being described in text, to what is being referred to in the image. And while this seems like a isolated task in itself, 
grounding is actually a, an important area that has to be solved first before you can solve a lot of these you know, fusion and alignment problems that come up later in these uh, new data sets. Uh, recently, people have also built these uh, larger scale description and grounding data sets. I really like this visual genome data set because it offers really, really fine grain annotations in text, as well as the bounding boxes of where they're referring to the image. So in this case, you always have these entities that correspond to nouns in the image. Like in this case, you have a girl corresponding to a bounding box around the girl. You also have uh, these attributes like behind. And there's going to be you know, man behind girl. So the man would correspond to this man behind the girl. So a very, very densely connected graph of all the entities in the image, as well as possible relationships between these entities. And this has also emerged as a very useful data set, both for reasoning and grounding, and also as a pre-training step towards building better multimodal representations for, for other tasks. So the main challenges here are definitely translation. The goal is to uh, you know, map data from one modality to semantically meaningful high dimensional data in another modality, so for example, image to captions. But at the same time, you need a very good representation that is aligned between these two modalities to be able to, to accurately perform translation. And when people kind of simplify the problem using referring expressions and you know, grounding, the core there is also the alignment problem between language and vision. All right, just two more sections to go. So for multimodal QA, the main motivation of this task was really to circumvent some of the challenges um, in image captioning and video captioning, where it's really hard to evaluate generation. So it's really to, sort, to, to convert these, you know, image and these media description tasks into a classification task. So one of the most popular is this visual question answering data set where you have a bunch of images, you're asking some questions like what color are her eyes, what is the mustache made of, and your goal is to localize what the question is referring to in the image and uncover the correct answer. This data set has been along for, for very long, it's been almost six years, and many, many methods have been proposed for this. So this VQA data set, uh, I think since then, people have also expanded it to include both real images and also synthetic images. And the benefit of this data set is that it's just really, really large in scale. There's more than 200,000 images. And in terms of these uh, multiple choice questions that are both true and false, it spans more than uh, 6 million answers, out of which 1.8 million are actually correct. And every year, at um, some of the language and vision conferences, there are these challenges for VQA. Um, and people have found that currently they're quite good at these yes and no questions. But some of the main challenges are that in uh, free form questions and counting. So free form questions are questions where the sentence structure differs quite, quite, quite a lot between training and testing. And counting is also a very difficult task. Like if I were to ask you know, how, many, how many yellow bananas are there, that is a more challenging task for for machine learning rather than just asking whether there is a yellow banana. Beyond supervised learning, people have also found some issues with these uh, VQA data sets, which is just guessing without an image. So just given a question and predicting an answer based on a question using these uh, purely language-based models, they actually perform pretty well. Uh, and adding the visual only leads to a 14% increase in accuracy. So one example is, um, if I have a VQA model, and I'm gonna ask the model, what color is the banana without actually looking at the image? Most of the time, your VQA model will answer yellow, just because 80% of the banana bananas in the training set are yellow. And as a result, if you actually test this VQA model on a green banana, which obviously doesn't happen that much, it's still gonna predict yellow. So some of these models are shown to be biased in the sense that they just rely on the simple form, uh, kind of looking at these simple statistics in a data set, looking at what correlates the most in these in the in the language modality and kind of ignoring the image, which is a more complex task for the model to do. And recently there have been some new data sets to to um, solve this problem by really having the same question, by giving the same question and having a bunch of images where the answer is different. So I like this example a lot. 
the question is where is the child sitting and most of the times you would just answer arms like, or arms or chair or something and you actually they actually got an image of a child sitting in a fridge to force the model to make sure that you know you can understand the image and answer fridge correctly so these are some of the uh, more interesting problems that people are looking at that that go beyond supervised learning and beyond vqa there's a bunch of other data sets most of them similar in vain. Um, here's a reference. You can look more at them if you're interested. These are all image-based QA. And likewise, people have also tried to extend this to uh, video-based QA. So TV QA is one where you're given a long-term TV show and you have to ask and answer questions at specific parts of the TV show. One challenge here is that one challenge here is that um, you also have to deal with compositional questions because some of the questions might actually refer to previous parts of the video or previous questions that have already been answered. VCR is also a nice data set. It extends VQA to um, requiring the model to give an explanation instead of, just, uh, instead of just giving the correct answer. And a lot of this does require some amount of common sense reasoning to provide a rationale for why the answer is true. One of the data sets that came out of our group is this uh, social IQ data set, which is a mix of you know, effective computing and also recent research in uh, multimodal QA. So it's a QA data set that is primarily focused on uh, social behaviors and social interactions. So things like, you know, uh, how is the discussion between the woman and the man in a white shirt? Uh, so one of the answers could be, she's blaming her in a tense voice and not letting him defend himself. So a lot of these don't really focus on objects, which VQA and VCR data sets have, and instead focus more on these social interactions. I have a question here. In VQA, do we manually balance the data so that it does not have any bias? That's a great question. I think there is no universal answer to this. Um, it, well, and this is a question that is not just specific to VQA. This is a question that happens everywhere in machine learning research. You're gonna collect some data sets. You think a data set is awesome, it's large, it's well annotated. But then you realize that the data set has you know, inherent, inherent biases. It can be biases in the annotation. It can be biases in the uh, data. It can be social biases, language biases, and so on. And people are generally split across what I think, you know, two different areas. One area is to take a closer look at the data set, balance it, make sure that it's not biased, which, you know, does work well, but it does require some effort. You know, you might have to remove certain portions of the data set. You might have to annotate new data to make sure that you know, all the aspects of bias are equally represented, which is a more challenging task. But I hope is that once you have a balanced data set, training a model results in a model that shows less bias. Another area is to ignore the data and really look at how a model can be used to take in bad bias data, but learn representations that are not biased. So that is more of the algorithmic challenge where you're trying to learn uh, unbiased, learn fair representations from possibly biased data. And that is also difficult because you have to define what bias means. Sometimes you might require retraining these models. Sometimes you might require you know, post-processing these models. But this is also a big area of research. And, and I really like this area. I think more people should work on it, especially in the context of multimodal research. I think the, the end result is possibly going to be a mix between making sure that bi data sets are unbiased, data sets, you know, try to be unbiased as possible, but at the same time, you also want to make sure that your algorithms, your evaluation metrics are actually accurately characterizing these biases at the same time. Yeah, great question. So in multimodal QA, uh, likewise, you know, a lot of research questions to look at translation, alignment, and representation are the, the main challenges as well as fusion. Uh, a lot of these challenges are the same as that, as uh, media description and retrieval. I think the main additional challenge that QA has is that you must also comprehend the question and localize what part of the image or video that the question is corresponding to. So in this case, alignment is a, is a bigger challenge than it would have been in media description. Cool, just to give a sense of what are some of the problems uh, that some students have worked on for, VQ, for um, multimodal QA. I really like this project from, 
fall 2019, I think. So the goal here is to uh, design adversarial attacks on these BQA models. So uh, for people who are unfamiliar, adversarial attacks are this uh, new area of research in ensuring testing and benchmarking the robustness of these deep learning methods. So deep learning obviously has, is very good at supervised learning and has obtained really, really good performance on multiple tasks, but people still don't really understand how most of these deep learning models work. And what people have found is that if you give the deep learning model an image, so in this case, you're giving it to a pre-trained image net, you're giving this image, it predicts Panda with pretty high confidence. That's good. You can actually add a really, really small amount of you know, Gaussian noise or some other type of noise, which, is, which causes a change that is basically imperceptible to the human eye. And if you put the same image to the neural network, it's gonna predict Gibbon with really, really high, 99.3% confidence. So this is um, what's called an adversarial attack. Uh, an attack because, an adversarial attack because it's making the neural network change a prediction to something that's clearly wrong with very high confidence and yet it's imperceptible to, to humans. And the goal here is not just to, to show that these attacks are possible. It's also more to show that, you know, th these are some adversarial settings that neural nets don't work well on. How can we show that, show, show some of these settings and at the same time benchmark and improve the robustness of these existing models? So a lot of these adversarial attacks are uh, start off being in computer vision, image classification. Uh, this group looked at the adversarial attacks on VQA models as a step towards benchmarking their robustness. And what would it look like in a VQA setting? So let's say this is the image that you started off with. And the question is what kind of flowers are in the vase? And your answer would be rose. If you know, everything went well. This was a pre-trained model, everything goes well. And they found that they were able to design these, um, these perturbations to the image. In this case, it's very interesting because they were able to design a perturbation that focuses primarily on the vase. And they were able to add this perturbation to the image, feed the same image to the VQA model, and given the same question, the VQA model will now predict sunflower instead of rose with very high, high uh, confidence. And the question here is how can we design a targeted attack on these images on VQA models, which will further help in assessing robustness of these existing methods? And the core idea here was to use a uh, fusion over the original image and the question to generate these adversarial perturbation maps that were localized with the, uh, that were localized in the image with respect to the question. So the hypothesis here is that, you know, the question helps you to localize these important visual regions. These are the uh, regions that the VQA model that is pre-trained will look at. And you really want to target these uh, important visual regions to get a better adversarial attack. So in this case, the question is, what is the man doing? They were able to generate uh, these perturbation maps that focus primarily on the man. In this case, a man is snowboarding. So these maps are primarily on the man. And these adversarial perturbation maps will then be uh, input added to the image and input to the model and force the model to, to make a wrong prediction. So this was an example of, um, of a pretty cool project um, where language helps in localizing which areas your adversarial attacks should focus on. I think they also found that if you just did adversarial attacks on the image, it would just be, you know, possibly something like uniform noise across the entire image that is not interpretable and that is not localizable with, with respect to where the question is answering. But they were able to generate uh, both you know, smaller perturbations of smaller norm and more localized to where the question is referring to. Cool. So just on to the very last uh, topic and very last set of data sets that I'll be introducing. And that is for multimodal navigation. And this really comes um, with you know, the, really, the growth of reinforcement learning and the growth of robotics that have really enabled the next gener generation of AI assistants to interact with the real world. We've seen a lot of these you know, personal assistants. We have these personal robots coming up. We have them being deployed both in simulation and also in the real world. We also have self-driving cars, which is another example of a AI agent that has to interact with the real world, possibly taking into account these multimodal signals. And the core challenge here is that in addition to just understanding language and vision, we also have to take actions in the real world. So it's really about both multimodal perception of the environment and also linking that to action. Uh, 
taking actions in the real world, which possibly leads you to a next state. And therefore you have a loop between your multimodal perception and actions that you have to take. So here's an example. You're in this environment. This is a hotel room. The user tells the robot to go to the entrance of the lounge area. So first the robot has to do exactly that. It goes to the entrance of the lounge area. It's gonna, and that, that's a set of actions that it's gonna take at the start. It's gonna take a response and tell the human that, you know, I'm here, what else should I do? The user would say on the right, there is a bar on top of the counter, you'll see a box and bring that to me. So that's also a very complex natural language instruction which the robot has to understand both the language and the visual environments and take these, um, these correct actions in order to execute these instructions. So here's like a, another example uh, to really illustrate the technical challenges that come here that, that arise in multimodal navigation. So we're gonna look at instruction following, for example. So we're gonna start with an instruction and you're also gonna start with an initial viewpoint that the robot is currently in. So in this case, the viewpoint is in this house facing a door. The first goal is to just start parsing the sentence and look at the instructions that are given. So you always have these, uh, these uh, verbs like find. So these find verbs represent the actions that you have to take in this environment. So in this case, the robot is starting to find something, in which case it could, find, it could be orienting its viewpoint. And you also have these nouns that help you localize and ground where you are at the environment. So in this case, you have a window. So you're gonna turn possibly you know, clockwise until you see a window, in which case you will stop. And then again, you would have this sequence of verbs that says look left, which represents the actions that you have. So it's gonna look left. And it's gonna keep looking left until it obtains another noun to ground where, where the robot should look at. And in this case, you would, look, you would turn left until you see the cribs. And this, this series of you know, action and grounding localization just keeps going on until you eventually finish, uh, in, finish the executing all the instructions. So you will go to, you will go and search for the crib and you will look for the target below the crib. And then you would return your answer to the human. So it's really about this action, language and vision loop that you have to execute throughout possibly long time steps before you actually complete the task. So there's been some uh, very new data sets, very realistic data sets in the real world and also with a, a good series of uh, instructions. One of this is the room to room data set, which is a navigation task in real buildings. You know, you have instructions like head upstairs and walk past the piano to the archway directly in front. And again, you have these you know, multi-step questions that go through multiple steps where you have to continuously localize and you know, take actions until you complete the entire instruction. Uh, I have a couple of questions here. So first question, for adversarial attacks on VQA, is it possible to generate class-specific perturbations? For example, changing roles specifically to sunflower or daffodil? Uh, the answer is yes. I'm not an expert in, in uh, adversarial attacks, but I have seen some people work on this. So in this case, um, a lot of this goes into the algorithm specifically designed for adversarial attacks. Essentially what they would try to do is that they would try to um, solve this optimization problem where you're given some amount of corruption you want to minimize this corruption that is added to the image while at the same time ensuring that the image the add plus the corruption feed forward through a neural network maximizes your prediction in some category. So that is a general setup. You want to you know, minimize the noise, such as the noise added to the image leads to the highest change in the output prediction. So that will cause you to uh, adversarially predict some other category. And I have seen work in uh, you know, changing this optimization to one where you are directly optimizing for one specific category, which you would want to predict maximally. Um, if you're interested in that, you know, definitely look at, look at the related works. Uh, going off of that question, is there work happening in modifying an image according to natural language instructions, turning the rose into a sunflower? Uh, the answer is also yes, although I don't remember the exact paper, I think, um, I'll have to check. I think if I find the paper corresponding to this, this project, 
I can link it on Piazza. But that's a really cool question. So the goal is to kind of take an image and give it a set of natural language instructions and kind of modify the image in this targeted way. Again, I'll assume the main challenges there are more of the evaluation than the, the model itself because uh, you know, image generation is always a very difficult problem. And if you would want to do like, you know, targeted image generation, that's also an even more difficult challenge. Cool. Um, just a couple of slides left. I think some of the very interesting projects that I have been looking at myself and a lot of the uh, research community has been looking at is this general area of language and games. So a lot of these are, these are some reinforcement learning games. This is called the NetHack game. If some of you are old, you might have played this when back in the days. Um, these are these grid world games where an agent has, is situated in some world and has to follow some natural language instructions like, you know, you, you know, this kind of moving pretty fast, but you're gonna see things like, you know, you, 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 you're, you're at this uh, crosswalk, there's like three ways to go. Which way do you wanna go? You see like a key, do you wanna pick it up? Do you wanna climb up the ladder and so on? So you're always faced with uh, both the environment that you're in, possible actions to take, you know, your cardinal directions, picking up objects, using objects. But at the same time, you're also given these uh, set of natural language instructions and prompts that you either have to follow or you have to reason about. These sim seem simple because they don't actually require real world images, but in terms of the reasoning and long-term reinforcement learning problems that you have to solve, I personally think these are more challenging than uh, these instruction following tasks. The main reason being that these instruction following tasks, a lot of it is partially supervised in the sense that you have, a, you have these reward signal that you obtain after you, you execute these instructions correctly. But a lot of these games have very, very sparse reward signals. So you really have to explore for a long time before you actually see something happening. Uh, the other benefit is that these are uh, language and games execute very quickly. You're not actually working with these high dimensional photorealistic images, but you're either working with these you know, pixel grid worlds. So they also run much faster and, and uh, are also good test beds for you to test your ideas on. Uh, another cool data set that I love, uh, this is a more difficult data set, is a data set that tests whether agents can both speak and act in a game. So what we've seen so far in these uh, multimodal navigation and multimodal reinforcement learning, the goal is only to perform an action, you know, either following the instructions or you know, moving up, down, left, right, executing instructions. The goal is only to act. In this case, these agents have to both speak and act, which really brings it towards uh, which really brings it towards this modern era of, of you know, building these socially intelligent models that both have to interact and act in these environments. So in this case, you are uh, you know, this player in this fantasy world where in this case you're a villager and the partner is, is, a, is a knight. And each of these agents are given some persona. And you're also given some goal, which is that you're supposed to either perform some actions or you're supposed to say something to the opposing player, the knight, to make them smile. So in this case, what you could say is that, wow, you're a real knight. Thanks for keeping us safe. I'd also love to be a knight someday. So that is something that you could say to the, uh, to the other player and the other player is also gonna predict an utterance, something that can be tough, but I'm happy to do it. I will protect the realm and also predict some actions like smile. So this, this is also like a pretty cool environment that really tests that kind of combines both dialogue. You have to um, converse back and forth with the other players, and you also have to take actions in this environment. Cool, so the core challenges here are primarily on representation, in my opinion, and fusion. So the goal here is uh, both to kind of reason about language as well as the environment. And the goal is to not just to get a representation that is useful for supervised learning, and to maximize the label at that one time step, is also to learn a good representation that can be useful for reinforcement learning. Being able to reason about long-term interactions with the world with possibly very sparse rewards. So uh, for those of you not familiar with reinforcement learning, I'm actually giving two more lectures on multimodal RL uh, towards the middle of the course. So we're really gonna go in depth into some of the learning algorithms and technical challenges in this area. Uh, if you're working with some of the, the recent data set where you have to both speak and act in dialogue, 
there's also going to be a translation problem where you have to take in your inputs and generate realistic utterances that interact with the environment. So just to give two uh, very quick examples of some of the course projects in this area, uh, this was, I think, about two years ago. And in this case, you're also in this embodied environment from the Doom video game. And the goal is to follow these instructions. Like, you know, go to the green short pillar, and you would like to go to that pillar. And you only get a positive reward of, of you know, plus, plus one if you reach it correctly and zero reward otherwise. And the goal here is to build a model that comprehends these instructions, are able to ground the entities. So in this case, grounding means understanding what it means to be green, what it means to be a pillar, what it means to be short, and so on. It has to ground these entities and relations and execute the instruction. So this paper was pretty interesting. They, uh, the model is quite simple, actually. So they, they embed these instructions using some uh, instruction processing model designed for text. They process the image to get some convolutional feature representations. And they perform a fusion using gated attention, essentially uh, learning a model that you know, takes in the instructions and attends to correct parts of the image to figure out which parts of the image are actually corresponding to the particular instructions. That gives you a representation. And normally, if you were doing something like QA, you would use this directly optimizes for the cross entropy loss for classification. But because this is a reinforcement learning problem, they have a policy. They, they have a policy learning module that outputs a policy, which is basically a, a distribution over what actions to take at every time step. And this policy is trained to maximize the long-term rewards of actually getting to the correct object, or getting to the correct object. And they found that this, this model actually learns to ground and compose attributes in natural language with the image features. So in this case, I'm saying composition because you want to learn these separate ground representations for green and torch so that you can also generalize to other attributes like red torch or right? small torch. So that, that means uh, that's really the concept of compositionality where you have to take these you know, basic feature representations grounded in the image and be able to compose them using different instructions. Another example just from this past year, um, we presented this paper at ECCV this year was that on multi-agent trajectory forecasting. So in this case, we're primarily concerned with you know, building these better models for these autonomous driving cars, uh, autonomous driving data sets in simulation. And the main problem here is that you're going to have these multiple agents, one, two, three, these can be uh, both cars, can be pedestrians, in this environment where you have these, uh, these road boundaries in white and you know, these pavements that you're not supposed to go to in black. And one of the core challenges in autonomous driving is to be is to be able to reason about these multiple agents and the possible trajectories that they could take in the future, so that you're actually going to be able to predict what you should take. You know, if you predict that the other agent is going to to go at a stop sign, then you should stop. If you predict that the pedestrian is going to cross, then you should stop as well. So the core challenge here was that we wanted to do a diverse trajectory forecasting. Instead of just predicting a single possible trajectory, we want to learn a probability distribution over these possible trajectories for each agent. And this distribution should reflect samples of a uh, low likelihood, such as you know, driving onto the pavement, pavement, which is not very likely, and also regions of a uh, high likelihood, such as you know, turning left or going straight. And in this case, just because you know, people are more likely to go straight than make a turn, you would have this multimodal distribution where one mode of going straight is more likely than a mode of uh, turning left. So this is also a pretty challenging problem. Uh, we have to build a probabilistic, probabilistic model across multiple agents to jointly, re jointly reason about all the possible trajectories that other agents are taking so that you can give accurate predictions of your trajectory. And we found that this model that both uh, looks at these agent-agent interactions, so modeling your interactions with other agents, and also agent-scene interactions are pretty important. So agent-scene interactions, like looking at what are the drivable areas of the map and what are the non-drivable areas of the map to generate this realistic distribution over possible future trajectories. Cool. 
so I know that was a long lecture and we're almost out of time. But just let me just give you some advice for the project moving forward. So um, there's a full list of data sets that we have, we have uh, kind of summarized for all of you, spanning the seven areas of affect recognition, media description, QA, navigation. I didn't go into dialogue, event detection, and cross-media retrieval, but a lot of these data sets are here. And definitely, uh, you don't have to look at the data sets directly in this list. You're also free to look at some other data sets, especially the new ones that have come out that we might not be aware of, or even some of the old ones that are not included in this list. But definitely let us know on Piazza if you find some other interesting data sets to look at. We also have more project examples on the website, including links to papers, to code, if they were released. So feel free to check that out. And just in general, uh, to give some advice about multimodal research and the projects they will be undertaking, I think the main thing is to think more about the research problems and ask important research questions instead of, and think less about the data sets themselves. So I know we're kind of motivating this lecture and going up, going into detail about a lot of these data sets and these data set specific models, but I always want everyone to keep in mind the main research problem that are inherent to many of these data sets that are inherent to the problem itself. And if you think about these research problems and design solutions based on these research problems, that also helps you build these more generalizable models that can work across several data sets within the same area. And likewise, if there's existing work in these areas, uh, in particular, I'm looking at effective computing, where a lot of the research started with psychology, you should also look at these existing research and aim for models that are also inspired by some of the work in psychology. There might be uh, some very interesting, you know, hand defined features, some very interesting modeling methods from psychology that are useful in this as well. Uh, another thing to take note of is that a lot of people in machine learning look primarily at performance with respect to some uh, you know, evaluation metric. I would think, I would suggest everyone to also think about the metrics beyond simple performance. So things like whether your model is robust to missing or noisy modalities, uh, whether you can design adversarial attacks to reason about the robustness of these methods. These are things that people who work on uh, you know, performance-driven multimodal learning don't really think of right now. So that I also think that a lot of research should be devoted into these areas so that we can actually make these models applicable in the real world. Another area is that of studying uh, social biases, whether these representations actually carry these speaker artifacts that are undesirable towards making a prediction. For example, you wouldn't want to pick up on someone's uh, race or gender if you are like making some sensitive prediction like related to affect or healthcare. So you want to make sure that your models are fair with your suspect. And likewise, you want to build uh, interpretable models, things that can be easily understood rather than black box methods. You can also build interpretable versions of existing models or methods to analyze existing models to make them more interpretable. A lot of multimodal learning really focuses on finding out what are the dependencies between modalities, what are the contributions of modalities, and that is still not an answered question. So any area of interpretable research that goes into answering these questions would also be useful contributions. Uh, likewise, nowadays people are trying to bring these methods into the real world, putting them on mobile devices. So uh, faster models in terms of training, storage, and inference are also welcome. And finally, I'll also encourage you know, people who have background in theory to also look at theoretical research. Um, a lot of the, a lot of the uh, lectures that we're gonna give are focused more on these intuitions and deep learning and experiments, but we're also hoping to look into more theoretical areas for multimodal learning. And if you have contributions in this area, that would be great as well. Just make sure that there's also a decent amount of experiments to validate your theory, although you, pro you probably don't need to run that many experiments as compared to a purely experimental research project. Cool, as just some final advice. Um, if you are used to dealing with text or speech, you're gonna realize that if you wanna deal with the images and videos, it can be a space, space can be an issue. So make sure that you either partner with someone who, uh, who has these large resources. And we're also going to be giving some of these uh, AWS and Google Cloud credits to help you in your research. 
and these will be announced on Piazza. Cool. So that's the end of the lecture today. Uh, just to give a recap on some of the upcoming course assignments, uh, make sure that you either look at today's lecture, look at the slides, or look at the videos if you're not attending this, this right now. Uh, look at some of the main project preferences, data sets, research topics that you're interested in. Uh, next Tuesday is a deadline for at least your initial list of project preferences. And we also reserve a moment uh, next Thursday to help everyone find teammates in this really cool interactive session that we have planned up. So here they're help, we're really trying to help you find you know, the best teammates, the best projects that you're most interested in to let everyone have a successful course project. Uh, two small tasks, the reading assignment is going to start next week. It's going to be due the following Friday. Make sure to, to uh, look at the reading assignments, discuss them with your group, start reading them and discussing them. And the lecture highlights are also going to be, start, be starting next week. So that one is also very simple. It's not meant to put a lot of pressure, it's just to chat that I know everyone is kind of understanding the basic material of the course and it's also to help us improve on whatever areas that was not explained too well. Yeah, so see Piazza for detailed instructions for all of these assignments. And that's it. Thanks for coming everyone. That is the end of today's lecture. I actually have a large appendix of uh, more multimodal data sets some of these are slides that we had in uh, previous versions of the course, you know, that we had to remove for lack of time, but you know, free, feel free to look at all of these data sets. We're gonna post all these slides on Piazza as well. Thank you. I'm gonna stay here for a couple more minutes in case people have questions.